Hey everybody, welcome to the Daily Objective, and today is uh, no ordinary day. It is episode 200 of the Daily Objective here on the Ayn Rand Center UK. Uh, a lot to get into today. It's going to be an extra long episode, and we've got more than just two co-hosts this time, and uh, a lot to talk about. We're going to reflect on some of our favorite memories. Uh, we're going to reflect on things, maybe even criticize. Who knows? We could be negative. Believe me, it, I've seen it happen. You know, uh, something happened to me recently. I, as you can probably tell if you're watching the video version of this on YouTube, uh, I am not in my current location. I am not surrounded by comic books, figurines. I am in an undisclosed location that will make more sense probably in the near future once you see what podcast I'm going to be uh, a guest on later today. And uh, I don't want to give it away, but um, let's just say the uh, the host of it is the one guy on Earth who can disguise himself by removing his hat. Uh, so something happened to me recently. I was uh, so a couple of friends of mine met me here in the undisclosed city that I'm in. And and it, obviously the first time I've traveled in a long time. This is the first time I've been, you know, catching up with people other than my kind of immediate circle in, in my own area uh, where I live. And uh, all I could talk to them about is th about this one podcast I've been getting into for the past year. It's called Red Bar. Now, not everyone who watches this is necessarily going to like that. I'm not like endorsing it and saying, go, you'll love it. It's and part of what I realized is that it's a, it's a very kind of particular type of show. But I've I've fallen in love with it. It's this sort of like punk rock comedy thing. And the host of it spends a lot of time sort of uh, throwing punches at big comedians like uh, Joe Rogan, Chris D'Elia, and uh, Ginger Santino. And as I'm telling my friends, I'm catching up with them, I'm like, oh, you got to check out Red Bar, Red Bar, Red Bar. Um, and they're like, yeah, but I like, you know, Santino. I think Santino is pretty good. And I'm like, no, no, you got to see Red Bar rip them apart. You'll, you'll, you'll realize how evil this Santino guy is. And then I, I, it, it occurred to me at the end of the night as I was walking to my hotel room, I realized I was walking the wrong way. Isn't that deep? I was walking the wrong way down the hall. So I stopped, turned around. Metaphorically also, I was going the wrong way. I realized I'm trying to push a philosophy on people. I'm trying to basically say this one podcast over here, this worldview that this type of podcast has with its sort of perspective on the universe and its sort of theory of comedy and entertainment. And, and this show, Red Bar, has like a perspective on what things are like and in this philosophy this ginger santino is the epitome of evil it's it might have some degree of truth but it's a philosophy and people who don't hold that philosophy are not necessarily ready to just swallow it and jump into it because i recommend it and so i realized you can't push a philosophy on people now why am i telling this story you're probably wondering i gotta think some of you are wondering but it probably should be a little bit obvious why I'm bringing up this story. It's because we can't push a philosophy on people. Now, uh, one thing we all have in common here at Ayn Rand Center UK is obviously we're all fans of Ayn Rand's work. I think we all agree with her philosophy, at least here on the Daily Objective, and we would all like to see it uh, reach new people. But something I'm uh, proud of with regards to the Daily Objective is that we take the benevolent route. We take the kind of look, look how much we like this approach. Like we want to talk about this for us. We enjoy discussing this and isn't this interesting and look how much we can sort of approach it differently. Um, that's kind of the route we go rather than trying to push it on the world and urge people. No, trust me, you read the fountainhead. You'll get it. You got to read. I think I've matured a bit in my, in my years. I'm happy to be doing the show at this particular point in life when I've been realizing increasingly you can't push a philosophy on people and you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want them to just take it dogmatically. All you can really do is believe it, because when you try to push it on people, that usually is a sign you're insecure about it. You're not entirely sure you agree with it. You're trying to force these ideas onto concrete reality and force it must not be initiated, my friends. So let's jump into episode 200 now that I've given you the opening monologue of opening monologues, the high production HD, uh, full audio system and lights and cameras edition of the opening monologue. Um, let's meet some of our co-hosts today. First off, in the order of proximity to me, we've got a guy who's currently shooting some type of production, 
somewhere in an undisclosed location himself. And judging by his uh, grooming appearance, he is about to play a real cool dude who hopefully uh, does not initiate force in this production against people over philosophy. Please welcome our uh, actor, Mark Pellegrino. What's up, Rucker? Uh Not much. Did you catch that story I just told? I could tell it again if you missed that. Um, please do. No, all right. <laughs> what's, what's up hey, was more of a figure of speech. You're always, suppo- you're always supposed to say yes, right? Yeah, yes and. Yes, and let's meet our co-host, uh, our, another co-host. Believe what? More than one co-host. We got a guy in Chicago. Now, this guy, I've said this before. You know, I hate to reuse an, an, uh, an introduction, but I can't help it. It's, it's, it's so true. He's from Chicago. A life of crime is the life that was basically cut out for him, right? But what did he do? He said, no, thanks. I'm going to get into philosophy and ideas, and I'm going to deal with money. And I'm going to make money by dealing with money, not by using my fist. Please welcome Jonathan Honig. I don't hear anything. You're on mute, John. Thank you, Rucka, and and thanks for for that introduction. Yes, of course, being from Chicago, it's almost just expected that I would begin a life of crime and and be participating in it at this point, certainly. But you know, I'm a believer in free will and uh, and believer in choosing one's own destiny. So thank you for for welcoming uh, me to the show and being a part of this. And you know, what's so exciting? We're talking with some of our longtime fans in the chat. Is that ultimately, as you said, it's not about pushing a philosophy. I hate that term, living one's best life. But for me, in my journey of objectivism, as, as a student of objectivism, it's just been about exploring how to live a great life. Isn't that what ultimately a philosophy should do and should be about? Is just helping you to live a great and successful life. And the fact that we have, you know, uh, Mark, uh, a successful working actor. I mean, Mark, I know, I think I saw a post about a new show, a new program you're involved in. I'm eager to hear a bit about that, but you know, Rucka and all that you do and Nikos, all that you do with your new book um, and that all I'm doing with my trading and my work, the fact that all of us as hosts are out there, as they say, living our best lives and just happen to be proponents of objectivism, I think is the best quote sales pitch you can get. Um, you know, I don't know if we're all at the top of our game, but hopefully we're all living our best lives. And that's, I know, what objectivism has helped me do. So I'm so glad we have the daily objective to connect with others. You know, your own Brooks said he thinks there's only 200,000 people worldwide who actually consider themselves, quote, objectivists. So I'm happy to be part of that club with all of you and so many of you on the Super Chats, especially. So thanks to Ayn Rand Center UK for making it happen and to you three for uh for the, 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 the kind of the privilege, if you will, to join you so many days out of the week for a lot of fun. Absolutely, a lot of fun and it's fulfilling and it's, and it's, it's a great way for me to start my day in my time zone. And it's, by the way, 200,001 because in recent years, the philosophy has uh, been discovered by a guy who, he's from Greece. You know, I've always said, if you know, the Greeks gave us philosophy and they can take it away. Please welcome Nikos Sotirakopoulos. Hi, everyone. So I was checking uh, the past episodes, and it's interesting because it's for me, it's like from the thumbnail and seeing my hair, for example, I can understand whether I'm in quarantine or not, which country I'm in. So it has been, it has been very much tied to my to the last nine months of my life. But uh, yeah, the way I can contribute to today's episode is either to tell you the backstory of how we decided to do this or a list of my favorite episodes, or actually what is my goal with the daily objective. But again, we'll see how this goes. Uh, Raka is in charge today, so he'll lead the discussion wherever he wants it to go. Oh, well, I didn't know I was in charge, but uh, I'll step to the occasion. So, Nikos, let me ask you something. Yes. What made you decide to uh, start the daily objective? (laughs) So, I don't know if you've noticed with the Lord Emperor behind the scenes, but he's one of the people who doesn't really believe in emails or text messages. He prefers to call people. So, we were having these very long discussions every day, and sometimes this discussion would have an audience. So, if there was, let's say, someone beside, then it would be quite a spectacle. So, if you've seen cartoons like, was it Sesame Street with Bert and Ernie, that they disagree all the time? 
but they, at the end of the day, love each other. So at some point, Razi said, wouldn't it be fun if this was a podcast? And here's a great injustice, that although it was his idea, then he decided that he's better off not appearing and being behind the scenes, which gave him the title of the Lord Emperor behind the scenes, which is a thing in itself. So that's how we decided to go with the daily objective. And the title was also his idea, I think. And he's, he's the person without whom there would be no daily objective. So the first episode aired on the 5th of June. It was a Friday. It was my last Friday in quarantine in Athens before I could be free and be outside in the world because I had traveled from the UK. And it was with Gloria. And the topic was the riots. And to be honest, when I did my best, the, the episodes I enjoy most, I noticed some patterns, but let's not go there now. I'll leave my best episodes for the end. So this is the backstory of the daily objective. So the idea is when objectivists talk to each other, it's an interesting experience. And actually, I heard John Watkins mentioning it also on our fundraising all-star episode. He said that when he was working in ARI, he noticed, you know what? These are interesting discussions. I wish more people could listen to them. So this was the starting point. And then the idea was, let's try to bring some something like an objectivist point of view on current affairs, on everyday issues, a short, fast-paced commentary on things that happened in culture, in politics, even in sports, as we do every now and then. So that's the idea behind the show. I hope it adds value to people's lives and I have more to say, but let's hear also from other people. I still think you and Rosie should uh, argue with each other on the air. And I love that Bert and Ernie uh, comparison. I actually, uh, I think some uh, graphic artists out there might be writing it down for uh, the next meme to go around the internet. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a great idea that you mentioning how the first episode was about the Capitol, not, not the Capitol Hill uh, storming, the, uh, the, uh, the, the earlier riots, um, in, in the BLM riots, I guess. And actually, think. sorry, I remember, I re although I haven't watched it since, I, rem I, I remember Gloria's first sentence in the show. It was, when you protest about something, make sure that your protest makes sense or it can succeed or something like that. So I think we were all, the first episode was a special memory for, for all of us, for me, all of us. I mean, me, Razi, and the two, three other people who, who were involved. But anyway, sorry, go on. No, that's all right. So, okay, I guess she was on the first episode. I remember I was in one of the new first episodes and, uh, episode. and it was the same topic, basically. What Wasn't it? The, the violence. This, yeah, the second episode, I think, was on... Uh, on something like uh, the, the 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 early cancellations or something like that, and I think the third one was on Jordan Peterson or something like that. So early we did Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, we did this type of uh, this type of stuff. Well, yeah. and, and I'll just say, I mean, the fact that there are ob ob episodes at all, I think, of objectivist type programming and objectivist inspired programming. You know, I've just been in awe. And listening, and you know, I'm a member of Harry Binswanger's lists, and been listening about the history of objectivism, and you know, to to harken back to Ayn Rand's comment that it's earlier than we think. You know, we're still so at the beginning, I think, of a, the objectivist movement, and we're a part of it. Where I think we're a small part of it, but we're building that community. And the fact that the Ayn Rand Center UK, and even here at the Daily Objective, we've had so many really objectivist scholars like Harry Binswanger, like. Uh, 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 Jim Valiant, who are really uh, experts in the philosophy who can help guide us, the students. Um, so that's part of what I think makes this whole conversation so interesting. And, you know, part of what the Anwin Center does has had some of these interesting and I don't want to say difficult discussions, but let's just say, I don't know, salacious, the idea of talking about objectivism and homosexuality or the Brandons, you know, a lot of topics that are a little bit, I don't know, I don't know, Nikos, they're not off color, but they're a little bit more challenging. Um, Ayn Rand Center UK and Daily Objective really encourages that, encourages that discussion and builds that community. So I'm so, it's fun for me to be part of it. I'm certainly not an expert, but 
20 years now into kind of being a student of objectivism, it's just fun to be part of this movement that's still really in its early ages. You know, all these these leftists, especially, who think that they're the cutting edge, it's like it's the same old stuff for them, but they're just recycling it. Objectivism really is new. It is radical. And the, these are the early stages, if you will. So it's fun to be part of that conversation still uh, really in its infancy in terms of its long-term potential in, in, in the culture. Can I ask something the co-hosts? So what do you think... How could you think that the day... Oh, and I have have to just say, if I could, thank you to all of our super chatters, Nathan Gungarie, Kira Parker, Kiriana Parker, Robert, thank you. And thanks to all of you for being part of this community and for your support. Please, Nico. So thanks so much, obviously, to our audience and to our super chatters. So how do the co-hosts view the success or the value of a podcast or of a daily commentary episode. So I'll start with how I would view the value of it. So a podcast literally changed my intellectual trajectory. So this is non-party line. This is, was my early, I was still a Marxist basically, but for some reason I was really hooked in the Austrian school. And it was the time that a, a libertarian called Tom Woods was beginning his podcast. So I became a very a, a very, how to put it, regular listener of his podcast. And at that point of my intellectual journey, it was very crucial for me for going from Marxism to what I would then consider libertarians. I hadn't discovered Ayn Rand yet. So in a way, the daily contact with someone who would bring people who would comment on stuff from a different point of view was very important for me. So I have experienced, and then later I found out Yaron Brook and Leonard Peikoff's podcast, so I could say that a series of podcasts actually changed my the, traje- the philosophical trajectory of my life. So I've seen the value of this daily contact with these things. So I'm also interested to hear the other co-hosts, how they would measure the value of such a daily product, should co- we should call it, event, uh, show, however you want to call it. How about you, Mark? Well, it's t- <laughs> wait, I'm a part of this? <laughs> um, part. Big part, what, huge part. What, um, yeah, you know, it's a little bit difficult to measure that kind of thing because so much of the message of, of, uh, of philosophy internally changes people. And, and that's where, that's where the, the, the podcasts are in essence like classrooms and, and the people who are helming the podcasts are, are like teachers where their influence may not be felt within that moment. But as John Adams said, teaching is the eternal is the eternal uh, vocation because uh, you never know where that influence that you've, that, that, that little piece of information that you've seeded into somebody's brain is gonna bear fruit somewhere down the line. Maybe not even in this generation, but you've changed them enough to, 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 to become fertile ground for change later on. So, I mean, yeah, we can't measure, we can't necessarily measure the success of a podcast by strict numbers and by strict audience, but, you know, because you can change one person, that person can change the entire world, or you can get through to, you know, 500 million people and do absolutely nothing. Um, and I, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of social media influencers who don't <laughs> really, pr- I don't think they produce that much value, other people do, but th- they certainly don't change the culture. Uh, Ayn Rand has that capacity and her philosophy has that capacity. And if we do it to the right person at the right time, the world can change. That could be the lever that moves the world. So and we're gaining ground, yeah. so that's the yeah. success. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, and as an observer, maybe trying to get that big picture perspective, I mean, I always see that Ayn Rand obviously gave us objectivism. I think Dr. Peikoff formalized it. This is my totally ignorant perspective, my, as, a, as I said, as, a, as observer, and people like Dr. B, uh, Dr. Uh, Brooke and others now with the Ayn Rand Center UK, with Prometheus Foundation, with the Ayn Rand Center, with the Ayn Rand Institute, are now formalizing the movement, you know, turning it in from a philosophy that a few people know here and there into a movement, into a global movement. And the fact that now that, you know, Dr. Brooke made mention that, you know, now there's competing objectivist um, shows to be on, podcasts to review, uh, uh, you know, 
programs have to keep up on. You know, it's now what's difficult is to keep up with the amount of, of content that is produced every day and every week by interesting objectivist scholars, including Ayn Rand Center UK. I mean, that's so I think, you know, how to judge as you asked Mark the, you know, the success. I think, you know, we're seeing it in real time because, you know, look, it wasn't just 20, 30 years ago. Objectivism literally was a bunch of guys getting together, probably cracking open a couple and listening to Dr. Peacock's podcast. Or it wasn't podcast, it was uh, 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 LPs. Courses, you know, they had yeah. to have the, yeah, they had to have the tapes sent to them. So now we all get together. People like Ed, thank you, Ed, for your contribution. Think people like Christopher, people like uh, Sister Lucifer, uh, Kiana, uh, you know, we're part of this daily conversation now. So I see that as a success. Uh, we're taking this philosophy now having it been formalized by Dr. Peikoff and others and turning it into a movement. Um, that's how you change the world. And we're part of it every day and every five pounds and every two pounds and every time you retweet and like and share, you're part of this movement that changed the world, changes the Let world. Let me also encourage the audience to tell us what is the type of content they get the most value. So we do sometimes current affairs, sometimes we have guests, sometimes we do movie reviews, Sometimes we do historical overuse like the ones we do with James Valiant, where, or sometimes we criticize quotes, I don't want to say bad, but people whose influence has been not good in some ways. So I'm very curious what, the what is the type of content that the audience gets the most uh, value from. I can take, on. for example, that, my, that the film reviews has been among my... Uh, favorite rocks. Mark. I just want to piggyback on that a little bit um, and pivot <laughs> to the side a, a tad. I also think it's valuable uh, for the audience to see objectivists disagreeing about the same topic. I, it's important for them. One of, one of the criticisms I see out there in the world, which is erroneous, of course, is that, you know, objectivists are monolithic. They're, they're, they're yes. a cult and they, they all think the same. Actually, no, they don't. Um, you, we may have, we may share values and we may share a, a a way of evaluating values and looking at the world, but that doesn't, that doesn't lead us all to the same pond. And we, we have very different conclusions about things from time to time. And I think it's important for objectivists and, and people curious about objectivism to see that this is really a, uh, an inclusive philosophy. You, you don't have to like, um, you know, particular artists or musicians in order to be a, a, an objectivist. You don't have to draw the same conclusions about, you know, many of the current events that we see out there to be a sincere and thoughtful objectivist. So I think it's important for them to see us disagree and haggle out the answers for ourselves. I totally, I totally agree. I mean, I remember reading how even back in kind of the early days, there was this sense of like, oh, do I have to dye my hair red? Like, you know, do I have to like architecture? Um, you know, do I have to like the same uh, 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 art that Ayn Rand necessarily likes? And I love Mark, as you said, and seeing that disagreement and seeing how objectivists can disagree about everything from, from po uh, the political uh, leaders to what type of art uh, and aesthetics they like. So I, I love, and that we can be as the Ayn Rand Center UK and as the Daily Objective, a place where a lot of those disagreements can be hashed out and explored, to me, is a lot of fun. That's what makes it fun. Yeah, by the I way, think... I forgot to mention my favorite type of content, which is the one that we're by no means expert, but it's super fun for me. It's things that have to do with relationships, intergender dynamics. The episode we did with, uh, with Gloria on uh, the Tommy Lauren advice to men, the stuff we've done on MGTOW or NIMCELS. So they're, they're very important topics, but at the same time, it's topics that usually they, you don't see from a philosophical point of view. So to be honest, they're my favorite ones. Yeah. Uh, so some of my favorite moments on the show is when I've uh, recalled things I've heard people like Leonard Peikoff, Ayn Rand, you know, the younger generations, Yaron Brook and et cetera. Moments I've heard them say something or write something that stuck with me and like now I'm, I'm seeing myself bringing it up on the topic that let's say we're discussing on a particular episode. So those are my kind of favorite moments, like these aha moments where I'm integrating. Those are the things that I like. And so uh, as to the question of what kind of influence is a show like this having, I, I you know, I think to the extent that we're all well-meaning and I, I think we all are, 
we are uh, showing uh, or people are getting to see us explore topics with an open mind and try to be as clear as we can and often citing people that are have been our teachers and are still our teachers. So like there's a lot of ways people can go wrong, right? Like they read Ayn Rand like and only Ayn Rand and they never really look much into what she taught Peacock or they don't read in they don't listen to what how Peacock sort of explains it to the to the next generation. It's uh, you can end up anywhere. I mean, we've got all types of freaks around the world, all, all types of kooks who think that, you know, who think they're in full agreement with Ayn Rand, but they're all over the place. They're anarchists, they're statists, they're, you know, you name it. So it's, uh, you know, to the, to the extent that I think we're having a healthy impact, even if we're not, you know, uh, spreading objectivism around the globe yet, I think uh, hopefully, I think this is the case, uh, a, a good handful of people are getting uh, a few good pointers that where, whereas they might have otherwise um, ended up all over the place for a long time. And also okay. something I like uh, uh, kind of as far as kind of like the impact this show is having, I'll say on myself, I've, um, I've seen it as a real exercise in broadcast. I'm not a broadcaster. I am an entertainer. So I'm in like the same family as broadcast, but I am not a seasoned radio slash, um, you know, pundit tree vet that's not been that's not what i'm uh most practiced at as you can see by me struggling to find my words currently so it's been great exercise for me it's been great exercise not only to practice speaking but also to have the topic introduced to me sometimes minutes before the show and to find a way to you know sincerely try and articulate some clear thoughts about the topic and to keep it going for 20 30 minutes um, so I've, uh, that, so that's been kind of a, a positive thing for me to be able to kind of use this opportunity to practice, uh, speaking and expressing myself properly and to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to sort of grow in that department, which sort of, I guess, uh, brings me to one of my favorite episodes that I, I was on. Um, and I like how we kind of started with kind of the first episodes ever. And like, we're kind of maybe going to move along, uh, maybe chronology chronologically, I suppose, perhaps, but early on in the series was one I did with uh, Gloria and Johan about is Sweden socialist. And I was early on on this show. So just like now, I'm still kind of learning how to broadcast back then. This was a new challenge for me. And I was not born knowing how to uh, how to introduce a topic like that to a live audience streaming live and to uh, to keep a conversation going with like a seasoned um, a seasoned podcasting woman, as well as like this Swedish famous book writer, like to just kind of to raise these things to them, you know, like it, it, it is not a skill that comes naturally to me. So the fact I'm willing to kind of rise to the occasion when these new challenges are hurled at me, I think is uh, is a positive impact that this show has had on myself. I'm just I have to say I'm so um, it's so fun to be with you each day. That's part of the selfish thing that I get out of this, to be with our community. And thank you, Christopher Smith, for your financial contribution and for, for being part of this. And Rucka, to hear you uh, um, to, to uh, c confess that, I mean, you have literally hundreds of millions of YouTube view views. You've acted as the MC uh, uh, in, in, for the Iran Institute on a number of, of occasions. I've seen you kind of be such a great host, if you will. So to see you every day, as you said, struggle, not struggle, but explore some of these issues and let yourself out a little bit is a lot of fun for me as a viewer and as a co-host. So I'm so happy to see you and Mark and Nikos, you know, and, and myself, as you said, kind of deal with uh, ripped from the headline issues, try to apply objectivism, understand them, work with them. Um, I mean, I remember, I think it was, um, uh, Larry Flint died, I think, one of the days that I was on the show, and that became the show's topic very quickly and things like that. It's a lot of fun to kind of deal with them, apply objectivism, think about them in our own lives, and uh, kind of uh, be able to bring it together with our community here in the Ayn Rand Center UK. I think it was a Rush Limbo where we jumped in. Oh, Sorry. Rush, right. Was Did someone want to oh, jump in? I heard someone, but I can't see all of you. I was, uh, thanking, I was thanking Jonathan for his compliments. Thank you. Oh. And as we can see, there's a big difference between scripted produced content versus getting live on the air and speaking. There's a not the same type of confidence. You have to build 
them separately. Hey, hey and I think, like, I think not that this is a pat, let's pat each other on the back session, but why not? Um, I think that, you know, we get a topic a few, a few minutes before and have to sort of spontaneously talk about it and think about it. That's, that's an acquired skill, man. That, that, that means that you've integrated quite a bit of philosophy in, in, in your thinking to be able to just spontaneously off the cuff draw conclusions about things that are pretty complicated. And to what Nikos was saying, I was favorite episodes are these, these episodes about uh, sex, gender, th things that you don't think are normally applicable to philosophy. That just shows that philosophy is everywhere. And so when, you, when you're watching the show and wondering why in the heck are they talking about this topic or that tackle? Well, because it's relevant. It's relevant to philosophy because philosophy touches everything. And also, it's important that we keep, in a way, each other on check. So, specifically with politics, it's very easy to go down the tribal route, and I've definitely done that. So, having, for example, Raka telling you, you know what, despite the lockdowns, the UK is not East Germany yet, so don't go that way. Or someone having people challenging me on my view, for example, on the US election is good, and it's also good for the audience because... It's not this monolithic view that we all go towards. So if, if one of us goes towards, quote, the wrong way, it's easier to see, wait a minute, what did this guy tell me? I'm not going to go by what he told me, but he's going to put me in a process of thinking. So maybe I'm a bit wrong here. So this is something. So that's where I've also got selfish value, so to speak, out of the daily objective. It's more difficult for me to go to routes that otherwise it would be easy for me to go down these routes. It's uh, pretty yeah. mind blowing uh, to me. Every so often it occurs to me, like I'm doing a podcast with a professor, right? Like what the Dude, hell? I'm a senior lecturer, not the professor. I've told you so many times, but thank you. The hell's the difference? You, gra you graduated from somewhere and you're teaching it to someone else. Like how am I even like able to change your mind on anything or even to know what the hell to say to you. I mean, it, it blows my mind every so often. Like, how did I end up here? Just because I'm a fan, you know, because like I actually I, I like philosophy and stuff enough to just read it and think about it. And and uh, it gives me just something to uh, to share on the show. So and, and um, thank you. Thank you, Helio, who is congratulating us on 200 episodes. He says he's enjoyed many of those, many of these. Thank you, Shadowblade, also congratulating us on, on 200 episodes. And I Rucka, they're fans like you and I are. They're fans of Ayn Rand. They're fans of objectivism. They're fans of stars like Mark Pellegrino and intellectual stars like Nikos as well. I mean, I feel like it as well, Nikos, my parents paid a lot of money to send me to Northwestern, you know, for, for, for us to get off for a couple of bucks on, on uh, uh, Super Chat to be able to listen to you lecture, listen to Harry Binswanger, listen to James talk about objectivism is cheap and ultimately so much more learning and influential. Okay, yeah. so now looking forward then, what is the goal? So is the goal to reach a particular amount of viewers? Is the goal to reach a particular amount of episodes? So I'll start with this as well. And it's just thinking on, on the spot because I haven't planned this. So the goal for me would be A, to keep enjoying this. So it has been from out of the 200, it has been very rare that I have been in a show and have been mm, not sure if I want to, to do that. And also to see that some, that some people are getting value out of it and that also the engagement is deeper. And also I really like what has been happening lately, which is after the show, we go to the clubhouse environment and we have the discussion there also with the audience and it becomes more like a radio show. So us keep enjoying it, finding topics and also seeing that peop real people get real value out of it are for me the three most important issues in terms of this going on for, for longer. Um, so for me, the uh, goal, I guess, is to keep it going, you know, to keep doing the show, um, to, not, to not end the show, right? Because projects don't continue themselves. They need a certain degree of, of motivation to continue. And uh, so that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to, it to continue going. And it's, it's not written in stone that it's always going to be the four of us. There may someday be a fifth person and maybe may down to three, whatever. There, there might be kind of a, an ever, like the, we, we've got a revolving cast of hosts now. Maybe that'll, instead of us alternating different days, maybe at some point it'll be people disappearing for three months and then coming back. And it's just, 
it's just kind of flexible that way. So Menudo. I just want to see because of people's, you know, like uh, schedules or, or whatever it is or or whatever it is. Maybe it could be negative things happening in people's lives. But I, I definitely would, would like to see the project continue. I'd like to see Rozzy um, get more involved um, on the stage, sort of in front of the camera. I think that's something everyone way, wants to see. Let me just say, that's the thing that's frustrating about philosophy. I mean, the first Ayn Rand book I read was one that was printed in the 60s. You know, it was like a secondhand book so look, we might be influencing people two and three and four years down the line, people we never know. That's what's so frustrating and so exciting about philosophy, I think, is that it is that long-term turnaround that someone might be influenced by part of what we're doing in terms of Aaron Center UK. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a daily thing. It's, uh, you know, it's a daily show, but it's trying to change the culture and culture in the UK or the US is a, it's a long-term endeavor. Sorry, I didn't mean to st step on you, Nikos. No, it's okay. I have a comment because I saw a comment and we need to figure something out with Raka. But Mark, what's your, how do you, how do you see this continuing as something which is continuing for good and not just to drag and stretch it for longer? <laughs> well, I think I liked your standards quite a bit. Those are pretty, pretty much my standards. And I would add to it if it's, I think it's included under the happiness thing that it continues to challenge me and make me grow, question my premises and uh, and think. And if I'm growing and changing and questioning my premises, I'm sure that I'm making somebody else out there do the same thing. And that's why I do it. And I think, it, I think look, we're, we're public figures and we all need practice at grappling with ideas in a public forum. And we need practice at answering questions in the most succinct and economical way possible. And sometimes shows like this are great for getting out you know, the, the intellectual detritus and getting right down to the heart of the matter, um, you know, and we can help each other with that so that when it comes time uh, to be on even bigger stages, we, we've, we've sorted it out in, in little laboratories like this. So gentlemen, Maria here reminds us that when we reach 1000 subscribers, my promise with Raka is that we would show up in a different attire, which for me was a leather jacket, for Raka was the white suit dress, what, uh, sorry, suit jacket and the fedora. The question now is, what are we doing for 2000 subscribers? So it could either be something fashion wise, the idea I had with Raka, with Turazi, but it didn't really fly, but maybe it will fly now is, we put a challenge in ourselves. So for example, I don't know, a hundred pull-ups or something and we have to, to record it or some, or not consecutive, but within a day or something. So we find something cool, something that is also a challenge for us. And it's supposedly is gonna be fun also, hopefully for the audience to see, but we need to put, some, we need to put a landmark, what's gonna happen when we reach 2000 subscribers. So I'm just putting it out there. We can also get ideas from the audience. So what do you wanna see? for the 2000 subscribers episode, which as someone out. So Rises will decide on Clubhouse. So yeah, let's put your, put your ideas out there. What's gonna be of value to you. And as someone said, the important thing is how that the 2000 subscribers have Just question, come. How many do we have now? And so now we have 1,600. So that's the important thing. We're gonna go from 1,000 to 2,000 way, way faster that we went from zero to 1,000. So, so maybe we should also start thinking the challenge for the 3,000, but one thing at a time. So let's start thinking now for the, for the 2,000. So Mark, what is your pull-up record? My pull-up record? Oh boy, yeah. I don't know. I mean, uh, I could probably do 100 push-ups in one sitting. I don't know about pull-ups. Wait, wait, in one sitting you mean consecutive? Push-ups. Consecutive, not in sets. Correct. That's impressive. Okay, maybe we should also consider this. <laughs> well, oh, I used to do more, but now I'm getting, I'm reconditioning. I used to be able to do more, but uh, it's, it's taking me time to get back into the swing of things. Okay, gentlemen, what else have we got or do we move to Clubhouse? No, no, no. Well, uh, we're supposed to go a little bit longer, but um, I mean, uh, so I've got a couple more moments uh from the show that i'll i wanted to touch upon so like for me uh one and now now we're moving a little bit later and we got the uh jonathan and mark era here upon us 
uh, the Leonard peak off birthday episode. That was, uh, that was really a, a, a wonderful opportunity to, to talk about things that matter to me, like, uh, memories, like, or ways in which this person's work has really impacted me. So I don't know Leonard Peikoff at all. I, don't, I never met him, but, but the fact that I had so much to say about him, uh, speaks to the power of words, the power of work, uh, the way that, um, things you do could be impacting somebody many years ahead. And I, I don't, obviously none of this is meant to imply that, that I'm doing anything that is, uh, can impact people the same way that like Leonard Peikoff does. I think we're, we're looking for parallel patterns, not in my opinion, not the same scale of influence. Um, but yeah, that was a wonderful episode. We got to talk about um, Leonard Peikoff, his work and how he impacted our lives and, and to wish him happy birthday. So that was, uh, I think that was a sort of a notable moment in the show's history for me. Uh, that was me, Mark and Jonathan uh, schmoozing it up a bit and it was earlier in their tenure on the show so it was a great kind of uh breaking breaking ground i guess if that's what the hey, great just... uh, what a great success and what a great tribute to the work that raz is doing that straight after that episode when he organized the event with the with the 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 not the daily objective the meetup event with the people talking about pickoff that leonard pickoff himself showed up so that was such an important moment for the center. And again, it all comes down to the work and the vision that Razi has. Because when Razi says, I'm going to invite Peacock, my reaction is, uh, okay, that's cute. Okay, but it's never going to happen. But his take is, no, it might happen. So again, that's uh, I was so happy. A, because it was such a nice event, but B, because Razi achieved that and you know he put so much work in it that it's nice seeing him achieve good things. And, and, and even just to know, and thank you, Nathan, once again, for more of your contributions. I mean, I know for me, when I first even discovered Leonard Peikoff, it, it was, I guess, in the 90s, because basically when I first, and I didn't honestly know, was it Peikoff? You know, like, I didn't, I didn't know anyone else who read any, who had read anything by this guy. And I, I, I had a, I had a girlfriend at one point, at that point around that, who kind of sneered at it, like, oh, you know, what did, what did Peikoff say today? And so just the fact that I'm in the UK and what we're doing is connecting people who've also read Peikoff, also been inspired by him. Like you said, uh, Rucka, I mean, maybe like you've never met him or whatever, but like you've also, also been encouraged by other people to read him, to read more of him. And that's part of what I think what we're doing here is we're creating this community like, oh yeah, he's really influenced my life as well. And certainly Dr. Peikoff's podcast, his being on our podcast, but encouraging other people to read his work, not just him, but just check out some of his other podcasts, uh, read some of his books, see some of his lectures. I mean, this is really influential stuff. I mean, it's changed everyone's life here from Nikos, Professor, to Mark, uh, you know, a tremendous actor and influencer, Rucka as well, to me, a guy in finance. So these are such powerful ideas. So whatever we can, we can do to encourage you to explore objectivism, explore Dr. Peikoff and Ayn Rand, to me, that's a win. When somebody's like, oh, yeah, I picked up Ayn Rand because I heard you mention it or name drop or whatever. To me, that's huge because I know that it's going to change their life. And what's bigger than that? That is a wonderful thing to hear. Somebody say, I, I, I read Ayn Rand because of you. Um, obviously, we don't know. I don't know yet what they're going to turn out like. They could end up, like I said, a complete doofus um, pushing for anarchy in, in the third world somewhere or trying to bring the third world here more accurately. But, but I mean, I'm glad they read Rand. And, uh, you know, it, some people do actually uh, move their life in a positive direction. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing to, uh, to hear somebody say. Um, and, you know, for me in particular, it's, it's about my own personal development. It's about the skill. It's about the fun. It's about, um, you know, the experience of getting involved with something like this. So, to me, I, I I always sort of cringe slightly just at the, the on the topic of like, you know, spreading the philosophy and changing the culture as as my opening monologue uh, exposed. Um, I I catch myself trying to be aggressive and just trying to emphasize changing other people. That that's obviously not the way. But but let's be honest, it is it is quite sweet to hear somebody say that they read Rand because of you, isn't it? Well, that's what Daniel Daniel Krauss, who's a wonderful part of our community, said. He read Rand because of you. And, you know, that's a, it's a major thing. It changes how people see the world. And as Rucka, as you said, I mean, look, 
maybe they do turn out shitty because they read Rand. But like, you know, it's a lot of, think about all the religious, <laughs> religious people we know who are like, yeah, I'm religious, but also my sense is to the extent we can expose to people to Rand's ideas, that's a win. That's a, a pat yeah. on our back and, and, and the center writ large and our community and subscribers. So thank you. And all just, for, just for Daniel Krauss alone, you know, Daniel Krauss alone, I, as little as I know him, I know enough to know that just his life alone, the way it's been impacted, you know, he's involved in Ayn Rand Center UK. He's not one of these schmucks who gets swept off his feet by Donald Trump and, uh, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos. This guy, he actually, he clearly was impacted by Ayn Rand and wants to learn what the philosophy actually is. So if you knew just one person's life would be impacted on that level, wouldn't you then go on like Ruben and give an interview about Ayn Rand just for that one person alone? So really just one person is all it takes. And, and notice then how one person changed and can impact more lives. So in one way, Daniel has impacted my life because he's my martial arts accountability partner. And since we said the accountability partnerships, I don't think I've missed more than I, there hasn't been a week where we haven't reached our goal or maybe missed one day or something. So this community gives you more benefits. Now, let me say one more thing before we finish. First of all, to ask Raz if I'm allowed to give them the name of the people who are behind the scenes, because I don't know if they want their names to be, or their first names to be out because their first name is, some of them is characteristic. But I will say, what is the process for an episode to go out? So the process is, no, okay, no names. But I'll say how many people are involved. So usually it's either Razi or myself. We come up with an uh, initial idea and we have a Slack, a 9 Center UK Slack, and we put there the idea. Then one of the members of our teams creates the poster and she's always there. She's always ready to do it on time. And we have a poster, even if we come up with a topic three, five minutes before the show. Then after the show, or while we prepare the show, Razi prepares a link. Then someone prepares a thumbnail. So the cool thumbnails that you see are not a coincidence. We have someone who is very, very talented in creating thumbnails. And then the short clips after the episodes, you see, we have another member of the team who creates the nice, uh, videos with the subtitles someone picks the videos someone else creates the videos so of course these people do not work for free and actually I have the suspicion that the Iron Run Center UK works all around the 24 hours of the day because we have people from four different countries at the moment thank you so much Marilyn by the way for, for your super chat we are so, we're, we're very thankful for that so we have people working in four different hours. So all around the clock, 24 hours around the clock, someone is working to give that content. And I had an idea that at some point we might want to make a video of ourselves and how our, our, our day goes through or the part of the day where we work for the Anron Center UK because many of us have also other things to do. But always, always, it's at least for me, it's one of my favorite parts of the day when I have to do something for the Iron Run Center UK. So many thanks to the team, many thanks to obviously to Razi, but also to the people who are behind the scenes. Their names are not out, but maybe if they want at some point, we can do a clubhouse or even a show where we bring them in in front of, of the screen. So that's what I wanted to say so have we got anything else or shall we move to clubhouse then well i was yeah, gonna well I, we, we got a few minutes left i think we were supposed to go for the full hour um and, and and uh you know you mentioned daniel is now your training partner or accountability partner and that's a way that one thing led to another that's enhanced your life and the ripple effect is real and i was going to wisecrack and maybe daniel could teach you objectivism as well which brings me to uh which brings me to something I actually wanted to bring up, which is that the the constant ripping, maybe not constant, but the ripping on Nikos, I think, has uh, been overdone by me. I don't know if anyone else. Maybe it's, maybe I shouldn't say, like, you know, we really need to stop ripping on Nikos when really I'm just, well, Razi as well, obviously, but he's rarely on this show. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's funny, but then, it like, is it still 
a joke when it's it's so frequent, you know, calling uh, Nikos a playboy and all these things, like just like making Nikos it, or calling him this, some red pill to pick up artist, uh, you know, <laughs> MGTOW. Like, at what point am I defaming the co-host, right? At what, well, what, at what, what point? Rand he, he's saying, not, that he's point, his is, he's saying, that's point is far away in the horizon. Don't worry about that point. It's nowhere near. All right. I mean, I mean, you don't think on some level like you're uh, like, what if women are watching this and they, they watch one episode and then they hear me repeatedly call you a uh, womanizer and they, they go, OK, well, he's not for me. Isn't that stepping on your toes? <laughs> but you're so confident that much is kind of it's sort of a backhanded compliment when I'm always ripping on you. It's because I think you can you can handle it. You, you, you don't mind. You understand things. There you go. All right. Well, I guess the ripping will commence. I was this was supposed to be some aha uh, uh -huh, coming to moment. Um, well, a couple of points I just wanted to mention, like, like jumping ahead, uh, when Donald Trump announced that he's going to sue for them to stop counting the votes on the night of the election and basically declaring his own victory. I had sort of an uh, and then the following morning, the news was out that Biden was leading by a lot of votes. And I got on the show, as always, had to collect my thoughts quick. And I sort of in real time, I sort of said I'm realizing more than ever kind of what it is about Trump that a lot of people really don't like for the right reasons. And also just how important method is. It's not about having the right conclusions. It really is about method. Better to end up with the wrong conclusion by accident as opposed to arbitrarily, dogmatically, or in some false way, jumping to the, you know, what you're told is the correct conclusion. And for that reason, I sort of realize in real time just how much is wrong with what the right has become as opposed to the left. Like, we all know what's wrong with the left, I think. But kind of what's gone wrong with conservatives in recent years became clear to me, honestly, on camera, speaking about it out loud. So that's how this show has impacted me, the fact that I'm called upon to speak about a topic as it's happening. Um, so that was a big one for me. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. I want to just quickly piggyback off that. I mean, you're a, a kind of a political reawakening. Alison Beard, who thank you for your contribution of $5, very similar, said, thanks to the people here that come onto the show, help me expand my political views and acknowledge more things are out there than I realize. So th thank you. And you know, Rand herself talked about uh, uh, the death of conservatism back in the 60s and 70s. We talked about that article here on the show as well. So I love the fact that so many of us have kind of come to some political uh, awakenings right here with the Daily Objective from the Ayn Rand Center UK. And let me clarify the discussion <laughs> when we just intervened in the chat, which says the beard goes or the beard stays. It talks about my beard because I just saw that the person you mentioned, our friend is called Beard as well. So our friend, no, it's not your surname. It's about this beard. So don't get offended if someone says the beard has to go. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, any other uh, thoughts or memories people have about the show? I, I know we're all, we're all sort of put on the spot today um, to come up with our greatest hits. But uh, I think we, we've shared a lot of general uh, ways in which the show has. I'll, I'll, I'll get. I'll go quickly too. I know we're, we're we don't have too much time left, but my my two selfishly favorite was why I love think why I love Halloween in which I dressed like a mime. Just give you a little taste of it there, and the other one was why I love the movie Wall Street. And in fact, little known fact, Oliver Stone himself liked the Iran Center UK's tweet about that film. So something tells me we had a lot of footage on that show. So Oliver Stone himself, I think, watched our show about Wall Street film and got a lot of traction. So, you know, someone in the chat asked, you know, aren't we still, are we still talking about Trump? And for me, my favorite shows have been those not about politics, those in which we've, we've tried to apply objectivism to other areas of the world. And there's so much to objectivism besides politics. So I hope that part of what we've done with the Daily Objective is explore some of those avenues as well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Ruben used to say back when he was, you know, leaving the left, people would accuse him of, uh, you know, why are you only criticizing the left? What about the right? And he used to say things like, I'm cleaning my own side of the street, because at the time he was a liberal, right? So he was saying, like, the leftists are acting this way, and I'm basically on the left. So I'm, I'm trying to focus on keeping my own side of the street clean. So I think similarly, in a way, like because we are not leftists and nobody mistakes objectivists for leftists, um, right? Nobody looks at at uh, uh, Linda Sarsour and says she's a Randian hero the way some people refer to <laughs> Donald Trump. It's important to like clarify like what's wrong with someone like Trump and the impact he's had 
on the Republican Party. They want their there's nothing left of the party that used to speak about capitalism and the rights of the individual. And worst of all, uh, the arbitrary nature of Trump's approach to discovering facts or just declaring them to me is the most shocking thing. And you can see it has it manifests in actual actions. It manifests in actual people running into the Capitol building, for instance. So it, it, it's more than just words. It, <clears throat> it, it has an effect on actions as well. But we'll so get more into it that. It turns out, family, future. that whenever we sit on the table all together, someone has to bring the issue that we tend to disagree. Someone has to bring Trump on the, on the Christmas table. So now someone needs to be that family member who's a peacemaker who's going to yeah. change the topic so that we move to something else. Don't look at well, me. Let's for go that. to Clubhouse. <laughs> let's talk to our audience. And let's say we, 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 we've, we've uh, celebrated our 2000s. Thank you to, to Mary Lean and to uh, Allison for all your generous contribution. Let's let's meet back here tomorrow at, two, at uh, the same time. But let's pick it up on Clubhouse and hear from, from uh, some of our community as well. Yeah. So let's we want to know what you think. House, and let me say also a thank you to my co host because we, we thank the people behind the scenes, we thank the audience. But I'm having a very good time with you guys, so thanks. Thanks, this is a, Thank you. This was a lot of fun, as always. It's always interesting to see what the four of us uh, will come up with. And uh, who knows if there's a fifth uh, host of this show somewhere that will some, someday we won't be able to imagine the show without, you know? Um, or alternately, maybe one of us will turn out to be kind of a dick, and, uh, and, then, and then there will be three. But um, and any, I, obviously, that's not going to happen. But, um, yeah, I guess uh, with that, we can jump over to Clubhouse. Thank you all, uh, all both on the show, off the show, watching everybody. Uh, thank you for 200 episodes. We're hoping uh, the next 200 will go smoothly, unless Big Tech has other plans, if you know what I'm getting at. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mary Aline, once again. And thank you, Fab0006, for your Swiss francs. And uh, we'll see you there at Clubhouse. Does that work And this guys? episode, I think, needs to dedicate to Mary Aline, the Super Chat Queen. Uh, she's really supported us. I know it means especially a lot to Rozzy, who, um, you know, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a fan of, of this thing bringing in money. Honestly, I don't know why. What, like, who cares? It's about having fun and uh, making friends along the way, the way I look at it. But Rozzy likes when money uh, comes in. And uh, we thank you for making Rozzy a little bit less sad when you do that, Mary Aline, especially, and as well as all the other Super Chats. Today was a wonderful day in that regard, and we thank you for that. And uh, with that, shall we jump over to Clubhouse? We shall indeed. Bye, right. everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>